Welcome to November 12th edition of um, in the strange and terrifying year of 2020 of VCCA Fireplace Chats. My name is Tanya Softich. I uh, have been a fellow at VCCA a number of times, and I currently serve as a member of the Board of Fellows of VCCA. As we all know, there are no readings, recitals, open studios at Mount St. Angelo right now, as the residency is closed due to the pandemic. The Fireplace Chat series is there to gather us, even virtually, as a community of artists, so we can be sustained by gathering to hear each other talk about our work and ask questions and sometimes give invaluable feedback to each other. Even though, of course, we are not gathering around the actual fireplace at Mount St. Angelo, tonight I have a distinct pleasure of introducing two wonderful artists and VCCA fellows, the poet and photographer Margaret B. Ingram and conceptual artist Sharon Norwood. Our first presenter, Margaret B. Ingram, or Peggy, um, was born in Atlanta, Georgia, and she now lives in Alexandria, Virginia. She's the recipient of an American Academy of Poetry Award, a Sam Reagan Prize, and she published three books and chapbooks of poetry. Peggy is a current member of the VCCA Board of Directors, and she is the past president. And she also served on the Fellows Council from 2008 to 2013 and was the chair from 2011 to 2013. Peggy has been in residence 16 times. Okay. Peggy, please take it away. Thank you, Tanya. And thank you all. Um, I'm going to read from my new collection that was published on April 1st by Paraclete Press. It's called Exploring This Terrain. Um, it's a one case where I hope a book will be judged by its cover. And I have to mention a little bit about its cover. It's, it's beautiful, I think. Um, but if you look over my shoulder, you will see the original piece of artwork from which that uh, cover was made. But most important, I want you to know that that lovely painting was also painted by a VCCA fellow um, Gray Dodson, whom I met um, on one, in one of my early residencies and have become just a great fan of her work and um, a wonderful friend. So um, thank you, Gray. I hope you're listening and um, you all can look over my shoulder and see that beautiful, um, beautiful image of uh, the landscape uh, around the VCCA. Um, my book, as I said, is called Exploring This Terrain, and it is divided into um, seven sections, each one um, examining a different type of terrain. I'm going to read, therefore, seven poems, one from each section, and um, as I introduce the poem, I will, um, before I give the title, I'll, I'll give the name of the section. Um, this first section is called In Mountain's Shade. And this poem um, was written at the BCCA um, uh, as I had uh, just gone in to the office to speak with B. Booker, who um, we all know and love and who will soon be leaving us, I'm very sorry to say. Um, but B, in her inimitable fashion, um, corrected me when I complained about the weather. And um, so I went out and uh, wrote this poem. It's called Ordinary Time. Just as I lamented the cloud cover, the forecast for another rainy day, she chided me, said yesterday had been so glorious, not for lack of rain, though there'd been none, but because last week there'd come torrents to green the lawn and nudge the buds along. Just as I spoke, the sun emerged again, began almost proverbially, another minuet with Vernal Fog, its opening of the grand dance hall to the crowds of chirping passerines. And the groundhog, I had not seen this month, came scuttling happily along the perimeter of the tottering barn. 
in light like this, I question how to hold blessings such as these in trembling hands, can barely understand as today ends in a pink robed gloaming where ordinary time concludes and season of bright gratitude begins. I have seen creation open itself pristine and I know that it is good. The second poem comes from the sec second section called All the Water Touches. Um, this is probably the most formal poem in the book. Um, it's called Ode for a Crossing Fox. And for those of you who are interested, it is written in quatrains of iambic hexameter. Ode for a Crossing Fox. Four days I passed along that spit of land between the ocean dunes and barrier sound and saw him lying there. I thought him bound inland as tides, and yet he faced instead, surely windward, toward the coastal side. Four days I passed. The first he seemed at rest, his coat still quick against the marshy grain. The second day, his flesh held tight as dream, as firm as sleep. His eyes remained yet deep. The third it was, the grackle came, walked wide about, but did not light. Then that night brought a rain that spanned the brim of the fourth day and left him changed, his skin as unrestrained as loose cadences of the wind that played from sea again across the slender bed the tender hands of grass had shaped for him. Four days I passed alone and saw at last from my remove just how perfect stillness would prove the ease of time in taking him out of sleep posture and his sure intent, would move him out of fractured circumstance, above the place where danger always danced, would guide us both beyond what finally seemed the strange ungainliness of his decease, leading lured over the finny plain of nesting clover into thick forest cover, in west into the hinterland, boundless beyond the estuary sound. The third is from this section called This Small Plot. It had to do mostly with my yard and uh, my family and things one would find or experience around home. This one is called Crossing. Saturday I went out early hoping to save my ailing garden from the clutch of drought. And focused as I was on the parched leaves and the browning grasses, I still heard the whirring of the hummingbird as he made his easy passes between the limbs of maple and crabapple and caught a quick iridescent flash before he darted behind the ash around the pine and climbed completely out of sight. Just before fall of dusk, it must have been, I went out again to look for summer clouds or any sign at all of rain. And at about the height I'd witnessed the hummers fading, I saw that one great blue heron moving without sound, deliberate and majestic, some, <clears throat> pardon me, some crown royalty, avian queen or king of the close realm of wetlands and of open air crossing from here to there mysteriously. So it was at day's end, as at its beginning, that they appeared so gracefully above my small place of dust and dying shrub, a huge heron and a minute ruby throat, the greater and the lesser of the birds. Neither one expected, and neither one of them known either for sustenance or for song. And yet that day, they were for me, both sweet manna on the wing and melody beyond any longing. The section is called The Company of Women. Two women. When she gave herself to Bach, she became two women, 
impassioned one swaying her small frame into the swell of the concerto's movement, following sharp, sharp allegro taps that her flirtatious fingers lay against bright ivory. The other, deliberate as she was, patiently measuring out adagio strokes that left her slender wrist curving in the air and drifting back. Remembering where first his hands had moved, she let herself become firm and fragile music and played out note by note, both what she was and what she could be, only for him. And this is End of Men. Um, I want to say that this is probably the most important poem in the book for me because it enshrines a precious and prescient and uh, present memory um, that I hold um, of my younger brother and his uh, niece who came, uh, whom I took um, to walk in the woods, deep woods, where we'd never been before, um, very near the DCCA. I think it was in Nelson County. It's called Unforeseen for Chip. If the stag had not shot from his sentinel post on a high on the beach line ridge and split the cinder trail just one pace in front of you, tossing his head in full careen, so we would see every point of his eight-timed rack before he disappeared into the echoing ravine. We would have passed through that October day as heedless as every buck during the rut. I would not have stopped, you would not have stopped short to ask if we had noticed how near and fast unforeseen danger had dared to make such a casual pass before us and we would not have moved so attentively into the hull of another man's timber. I would never have heard your daughter say, these look just like Papa's woods, when we approached the place where a wide creek meandered on past itself. Nor, after I forded first at the narrows and looked back as you spread your feet to keep everything in balance and reached to guide her, over the fell trunk, would I have chanced to see in that flash, as white hot as the flame tail of the fleeing buck, an after image of our father and me, and how closely the generations follow when they encounter unfamiliar waters. This is from the section entitled uh, The Wisdom of Creatures. And those of you who were fellows at the DCCA when um, we used to have horses there might recognize this scene. It's called Witness. Beside the pasture this morning, I witnessed the anticipation of the one waiting horse turn to what seemed disappointment at the discovery of my empty hand while the second small stallion watched content from behind the frosty nimbus of his breath before they thundered off together, whinnying, to find satiety in new grass and withered shoot. Not harnessed by the question around which we so aimlessly try of how to make every desire our own private possession. For them, in their land of plenty, Sufficiency is always a given, for what is given is sufficient. And finally, um, from the last section entitled What Abides, a poem called Keeping Silence. Um, my friend, um, the composer Gary Davison, whom I met at my very first uh, residency at BCCA and who, with whom I've um, collaborated twice, most importantly to create a choral symphony uh, to celebrate the 10th or remember 
memorial as the 10th anniversary of 9-11 that was performed here in the D.C. area. So uh, Gary said that this was his favorite poem in the book. So this is for him. It has the epigraph from the book of Habakkuk, but all the earth keep silence before him. The mist distills in strands of luminous beads along the quivering lips of leaves, poised to tell their vain imaginings, secrets hidden soul within their feet. What sends the sleek red foxes back into their lairs before the day descends? Or what it is that moves beyond the trees, when what it is that moves is more than breeze? Why moonlight never has the strength to make the stars recede. Old oaks are poised to give their own account of these. Yet silence is their inheritance, a sacred bond they cannot break until wind wills to turn leaves into holy instruments, instill the gifts as tongues by which they whisper, trill, sing its songs, then tremble into quiet once again before they heed its one last call to fall burnished without toil, transform the barrenness of autumn's muted soil. soil. Thank you all. Thank you, Peggy. That was beautiful. Our next speaker is, presenter is Sharon Norwood, um, who lives and works in Savannah, Georgia. Her work spans several media and has been exhibited throughout US, Canada, Jamaica, Korea, and Germany. Her work has been showcased in several biennials, including, um, including the Jamaica, Atlanta, and Florida biennial. In 2019, Sharon was a Joan Mitchell Foundation nominee, grant nominee. Um, and Sharon was also the 2019 recipient of VCCA Jacques and Natasha Gelman Fellowship. Welcome, Sharon. Take it away. Thank you, Tanya. Thank you, Tanya. Um, thank you, um, Margaret. I really enjoyed your reading. Um, I just wanted to uh, do um, present my work a little bit differently. that um, I received the Jack and Natasha Jobin Fellowship in 2019 that allowed me to spend two marvelous weeks at um, VCCA where I um, created a, bod some, a series of work that I'm going to present today. Um, yeah, I'll just, so I'll just jump right in. Um, so, uh, you know, spending the summers in uh, North is probably not the worst thing you can do when you are from Savannah, Georgia. It's really um, quite hot here in the summer. So it was really lovely getting away. This was actually my very first time after finishing grad, my grad studies, um, getting a studio space where I could uh, take out on work and um, see a lot of the work that I had, I had been making and actually have like a formal place where I could actually make um, sport. So it was really exciting um, being at um, VCCA. And here is a picture of my studio um, once I was there. Um, I Generally, I work um, across mediums. I usually have many projects on the go. For my VCCA residency, I was thinking more to spend a lot of my time um, working two-dimensionally um, with the mark and with painting and um, trying to sort of um, work through my ideas um, regarding um, using a very sort of minimal language to sort of articulate um, some of the things that I was thinking about in the studio. And I think at the time I was thinking in terms of mark making and gesture making as it began showing some of the work that I was doing there. And then I'll also, I'll, 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 I'll be speaking about the work I did at, um, at the residency, and then I'm gonna 
also speak about some of the works that I've been doing um, more recently um, in regards to my 2D language. So here's a, um, one of the painting slash drawing that I went into um, lace making. So here I'm thinking about the quality of the line, the quality of the mark, repetition, um, layering um, the image in order to sort of build um, something that feels um, complete. Um, a lot of experimentation and play. Um, I believe I did it maybe about 20 of these drawings while I was there. And, and they all vary in, in very sort of um, density and um, play. In this one, I believe I was just thinking about the mark and the curly line as being sort of this playful gestural thing. Um, there is sort of a figurative kind of um, image that sort of came out of this one when I sort of started um, playing around with pouring and um, again, layering um, the image in order to sort of build um, composition. Some more uh, work that I've done. And these are all like 18 by 24 inch on Arches paper. So there's watercolor. Um, I think I was also incorporating um, different um, variations of black in terms of black, warm black and cool black inks in order to sort of build imagery. Um, also in my work, um, I've been playing a lot with like fibers, thinking about fiber and thinking about um, some of the um, um, marks and some of the perhaps um, crafts, early crafts done by women. So there's a lot of gendered um, sort of conversation that happens in my work. So in these pieces, I was bringing back in um, these sort of very decorative elements that sometimes um, appear in my work where I'm uh, layering um, conversations with materials and objects and uh, marks that, uh, is, that make sort of a cyclical appearance within my work. So I tend to sort of navigate um, space with the same type of Im imagery, but mixed up and sort of repurposed and um, used um, in very different ways in my work. Um, so here I'm back um, showing you my studio where you can see some of those um, paintings and drawings that I was working on. Um, also, um, one of the wonderful things about VCCA is you get this private studio space, so you're really able to sort of like um, lock yourself in if you want and sort of work through very much as you, you're able to. So for me, it was really, again, very nice to um, put all my things out and to be able to see how things relate and, again, all sort of work between ideas and between projects. So some of the work that I sometimes consider those like sketches, like ideas that I'm thinking about that I'm slowly developing into other um, bodies. So in, 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 in the, while I was at VCC, I was using, you know, creating new marks and new gestures. And these images here are three images of early drawings that I use. And my, my work, in my work, I generally tend to, um, reuse the mark over it from, from over and over. Um, so the, my mark sometimes becomes um, material for collaging. Like in the bottom right, you'll see that there's a porcelain piece where I'm using my original drawings as material um, for layering onto the porcelain surface. So, um, and, and again, this is also the same, me using original drawings as material to layer onto um, these found objects. So what I've been doing most recently is I've been using my mark, the original mark, but using that as patterning. So I'm using my I'm using my original drawings and um, taking those marks and creating different images um, with those original marks. So it's kind of like I'm using like this um, repetitive kind of um, image that's appropriated from my original drawings. 
it's a back and forth way that I'm that I kind of work between original marked to sort of the appropriated mark, and then using th that appropriate mark as a material for for creating new patterns. More of, of the same of what I've I've been working on more recent works with the mark as pattern. And also one of the things that I do in my practice. Um, is I'm always working between and 2D and the 3D, and so I'm always trying to create a conversation between the two. So here, you know, we've got the the drawing and the three-dimensional object kind of interacting, and the, the drawings are engaging with the three-dimensional object in a kind of a new way. And the, this is a space that I'm kind of looking at currently. More of the same, the drawing interacts or interacting with the three dimensional. And um, just to top it off, just to, to end my um, presentation, um, I just wanted to show just a little bit of where my work um, began in terms of the mark, um, my original drawing being used as mark. And then um, the, the original marks also being abstracted further into sort of a three-dimensional space. Um, yeah, so even though the works are a little bit different here, I feel like they're like this, essentially the same um, language. And um, if anyone is really interested in seeing more of my work, um, you know, you're welcome to also visit my website where I have more chronological, whereas in this presentation, I really wanted to talk about some of the work that I did at PCCA and and, um, and then bring it um, experience you can have at, at a residency. And this is this image here is one of um, was one of um, uh, it's Robert, one of the other fellows that was at the residency that we were we were having. And it's I mean, COVID's really change things but here is an opportunity where we can um, invite studio um, other artists and visitors to um, VCA to come to our studio and what we're working on and to engage with the work and that's um, a really lovely experience I hope we can get back to that um, soon and let me see I believe I'm getting yeah close to my end yeah yeah I think that's the last one was um yeah that's the last one yeah, so thank you um, for um, for viewing my presentation, and um, I think that's, that's if there's any questions. There, uh, I do see um, questions, and I am going to get to them very shortly. But wow, thank you both very much. You have taken us to. Um, some wonderful worlds and mm -hmm. um, Sharon, as you were presenting, I was thinking how generous it is that you have taken us to your studio at VCCA and um, and I just thought how precious the experience of VCCA is to art is that we talk to each other in these sort of slightly vulnerable early stages of gestation you know of the work and that um how uh and you know thinking uh, looking at bodies of work that you have made you know that it has given work to it's 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 just a beautiful tribute to vcca and of course um uh peggy i am so grateful that um uh, groundhog was mentioned so, <laughs> my friend, the great <laughs> groundhog, near, the one near the shed. Yes. <laughs> so, um, so here, uh, here comes the question, and let me try to be a good host. Um, the first question is for Sharon. Um, hi, Karen from Karen Bell, photographer, fellow. Um, uh, fellow fellow a friend um sharon how much is nature an influence on your work how much is how much is nature an influence in my work well i think when i think of my um drawings i i'm definitely thinking of them in terms of landscape so in that way i think um nature plays a part i mean i used to do figures whereas now i'm 
Um, the work is not so much figurative, as, although they still represent um, the body um, um, mm -hmm. or the black body specifically. Uh, so, in, yeah, I think nature is a part of the work. I mean, I, I work organically, so you know, so it also in that regard, perhaps nature. Yeah, um, yeah. Not so much flora and fauna, perhaps, mm -hmm. um, in a very sort of specific mm -hmm. kind of way. Yeah. So speaking of nature, you know, um, let me turn to Peggy and um, uh, in in uh, in your garden poem, you know, garden and drought poem. Um, the um, you know, I had a. Of course, that is what poems do. That's what lyrical poetry does. But um, there was a sense of. Um, looking at one small painting after another, almost looking at things that some somebody would do in painting on very small panel or canvas a la prima very quickly. But then, you know, your form is so beautiful and so classical. So um, I don't know how much of this is a question or is maybe an invitation to, uh, you're sitting in front of the images to talk to those of us who are, you know, maybe not poet, poets about relationship of images and um, language in your work. Well, I think that you have hit on a, a very obvious fact that my poem is, my poems are, I think, image laden. Um, mm -hmm. Not true of all contemporary poetry today. And, and I think in, in many ways, a part of that harkens back to the fact that I've been around for a long time and been writing for a long time. But the mm -hmm. other thing, Tanya, is that, I um, mean, I think that you mentioned it at, at the beginning of, uh, in the introduction, um, I am a photographer as well as um, a, a, a poet. And um, so yes. I, I focus, I absolutely focus on the image. and. Um, it's the it's the image that gives birth to the poem and not the poem that gives birth to the image for me yeah um, and yeah. the image and sometimes it's it's a, it's a sound as well but it's 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 an observation that i have that i never mm -hmm. i never decide for example and oh today i'm going to write a poem about this or that but it's yeah. a matter of being completely attentive to what's happening around, whether it's a, a visual image or a, a song of a bird or even a, a chiding of a bee booker um, <laughs> about not being so grumpy about the rain. <laughs> yeah. They're given to me. Yeah. And then, and then, and then the, the, the poem for me is an act, an act of exploration, which is part of the reason that the, the book is entitled Exploring This Direction. Yeah. Um, well, here comes the another comment by Karen Bell. Peggy is a wonderful photographer, has a great eye. I'm sure that informs her poems. Um, you, so both of you, uh, Peggy and Sharon, both of you um, uh, skip media and modes of working and uh, uh, you know, you that the, there's a thread of your work, of course, going through um, every, through everything, your photographs and your poems, you know, Peggy and for Sharon, um, you know, these images permeate many different media from video and animation to um, ceramics. So, you know, both of you are very sort of grounded in uh, physical world, you know, Sharon, you in materiality of, you know, some of your pieces um, and Margaret, um, Peggy, in your images, but you take flights with it across the media, both of you. So Sharon, here's a question for you from Barbara Campisi. Hi, Barbara. Um, can you talk about the history of the China that you use and the rela relationship to the drawings on them? Okay. Um, so um, with in my work, I tend to use found objects a lot, although that wasn't apparent in the 2D, 2D presentation that I was doing. Um, but um, So a lot of the times the work 
um, the material or the objects that I find are like porcelain and so, or fine china. And those come already packed with a certain history of their own. And so what I do is I tend to marry them with the, the curly mark, with my um, racialized mm -hmm. um, signifier. And so, uh, you know, in hopes of sort of like changing perhaps the narrative or um, intersecting, intersecting the conversation in a sort of a very specific way. So I think that's what she's speaking of. That's that's what she's speaking about. Like you know, that's the importance of the work. And so for me, I think I'm dealing with a very limited, a very scaled down language. Like I've reduced my language. I feel like to, to a very simple language. And so in order to have these complex conversations, um, using objects already embedded with history just makes it a lot easier for me to sort of articulate my ideas in a very mm -hmm. sort of specific way. Mm-hmm. Um. Yeah, it's, you know, there's a sense, you know, in your work in the lines of sort of this, you know, extraction, you know, the essence, the, the essential oil of these oil marks that you have made, you know, there's a sense that they have been distilled to this, you have, uh, you know, reduced in a sense of great balsamic reduction, you know, rather than reduced. So, um, right. Uh, so, yeah, so, um when I looked at your work for a first time on your website and I looked at that series, you know, with the hair and the porcelain, um, and of course we can all think about, you know, the uh, Merit Oppenheim and his furry cup. Um, but, you know, I'm also thinking about the relationship of that fine China and hair and sort of playing with that sort of ultimate you know, taboo hair in your teacup, hair on your soap in the other, you know, in the other works. And my first reaction was like, ooh, scratchy. You know, let's look at this scratchy thing that we would all like to avoid looking at and talking about. So it's it's uh, it's very powerful in that sense. And it, it reminded me also, you know, working with China of, Cheslav Milos poem, I don't know if uh, you know it, called Porcelain, I believe. Um, uh, it, it takes the fragility of the porcelain particles and places them in a war-ravaged landscape and um, just puts these two images there and lets us figure it out and feel it, really feel it. So. Uh, mm -hmm. That was my other association, you know, with your work. Yeah, I think what's really interesting about the work is that because, you know, hair is something that we can all relate to. I think when you see the work, you automatically go back mm -hmm. to self, you know, whether it's, you mm -hmm. know, thinking about your physical reaction to finding hair in these, you know, misplaced. But it, it definitely takes you to sort of like an intimate conversation with yourself about the work, with the work, which is, you know. Um, I think it's it's it's, it's interesting and make mm -hmm. it kind of make the make the work in itself exciting to see just how people are connecting with the work. Mm -hmm. it, it it resonates in may, on many many different levels, and I think it, it 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 has it's a house that has many doors that you can come through, um, if you would. Um, let me let me look and see if there are any um, other, you know, com comments, um, so that I don't talk too much. But um, you know, speaking of many doors um, entering and exiting, um, uh, one of the things, you know, Peggy, that I was struck by is expansiveness of your observation of landscape and, um, or, you know, miniatures of the garden, you know, close-ups, if you will, details of the garden um, and um, your beautiful form. And, you know, people don't mention the phrase of, you know, iambic tetrameter, you know, these days anymore. That's, um, you know, and as somebody who had, you know, who went to school where I had to have four years of Latin, I'm thinking, form people, check this out. So uh, 
can you can you uh, can you talk a little bit about form in lyrical poetry and form's relationship to the images that are and you know that your poetry brings to life if you will i, I can but tanya i want to i want to start first with a bit of a, a, a funny story i think um th mm -hmm. that particular ode ode to a crossing fox the you know mm -hmm. the, the uh, quatrains of of iambic uh, pentameter um that poem actually started out as um a, a very free form poem i mean there there was no attention to to form at all um, mm -hmm. and um and i thought it was finished and i sent it to a friend of mine a poet um named steve myers and he said well peggy you know i'm sorry you you call this an ode <laughs> and it's not so <laughs> so step up <laughs> you can change the title or you can formalize the poem and yep. mm -hmm. um, I took that as a real challenge. Um, and then I was writing much more in free verse at the time. And, and I think that that exercise sort of launched me on an, a, a journey of discovery of, uh, and a challenge um, to begin to, to, to take what had been for me for years and years for free verse and to, to see what would happen um, mm. um, if I tried to lay them out in a formal fashion. And what mm -hmm. that would have, and it it made me not just attentive um, to the length of the line or the shape of the the poem on the page, but it made me very much attentive to every word in the poem and to its content and to its movement um, throughout the piece. And mm -hmm. and form was not in any way constraining mm -hmm. to me. Um, I don't think or to the work, but it was the very opposite. It it, it was liberating. Yeah. And all the poems in this book are not formal, but it just happened that most yeah, of them yeah. were, so, yeah. Yeah, but I have, you know, appreciated that. I'm so glad you're back, Sharon. For a minute, we lost your image. And then I was looking mm -hmm. at that thing that, that circle that Google oh. does, and I thought, she's doing this on purpo purpose. Look at these curls. <laughs> and <laughs> yeah. So, um, <laughs> So um, I believe that we are at about the time when we should be wrapping this up. Let me give one more look. I don't want to leave any questions unanswered um, from our audience. Um, well, I would like to thank you both for um, for honoring me with hosting um, this uh fireplace uh chat ser series installment and everybody have a good night and um don't look at too many news and uh breathe and go for long walks and you know the universe is unfolding exactly as they should and stay calm yeah. sharon and peggy thank you very much thank you